Hello, I'm Jim Halfpenny, and I welcome you to A Gathering of Naturalists. A Gathering is hosted by A Naturalist World, an ecological education company located at the north entrance to Yellowstone National Park. Our company sponsors educational programs and research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We also host this free lecture series, A Gathering of Naturalists, which highlights the knowledge and expertise of those who live, study, and love the ecosystem. Now, please join us for our program. Well, hey, thank you for coming out. It's really nice to see everyone out. Um, I'm just going to uh, not really talk about plant adaptation so much to the extreme, but um, give you first an overview of the flora and the park and talk about where we get our diversity. And then uh, give you some updates on things that have happened, particularly last year, and then a project that we've been working on for the last couple of years, and then talk a little bit about the herbarium, which many of you probably know is in Gardner, um, and it's a wonderful gem, and Sam has been volunteering, and Anne has been blooming there for years and years and years. <laughs> <laughs> She's uh, like blue thousands by now. So anyway, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the what they're hoping um, to do with the herbarium. So. Um, yeah, so we have um, 1,500 in, uh, uh, taxa, and so that includes subspecies and varieties. It doesn't, it's not just a subspecies level. And of those, about 238 are non-native species. Um, and I would say that if you really want the exact numbers to refer to the park website, because I am not good with numbers, <laughs> and um, whatever's in the resource and issues handbook, I've checked and double checked and double checked. So yeah, we are at the edge of a couple different ecotones. So we're at the edge of the Great Basin flora, and then we're at the edge of the Intermountain flora. And um, then we also just have the general Rocky Mountain flora. And uh, in addition, we have the thermal feature. So that's kind of what's affecting the biodiversity. So I thought we'd start with Beckler, which is the wettest part of the park. It gets over 80 inches of precipitation a year. And it's also the wettest part of the state of Wyoming. And so because of that, there are a lot of plants that only occur there for the state of Wyoming and are listed on the rare plant list. And then within the park, definitely also occur in the park. So we have some pretty um, exciting rare plants. And one of the places that we could probably have another discovery for the park um, this year, we did some work down there. So I'll talk a little bit about that too later. Gardner is the driest part of the park. Uh, we get less than 10 inches of precipitation a year. And it's also the driest part of the state of Montana. And so um, because of that, we have rare plants that occur in the park and are rare for the state of Montana, but are not necessarily rare in the state of Wyoming. <laughs> so some political boundaries going on there. Uh, and then we have the thermal features. And so uh, it, at the thermal areas, we have sort of a typical suite of plants that are grow kind of, if you look at Mattis or Norris and Old Faithful, but then we have a few things that are rare and are um, only growing in certain locations. So purple monkey flower um, is one and it's disjunct from the Pacific Northwest. And so it is pretty rare in the park. It grows at Old Faithful, but then also obsidian sands at Hayden Valley and obsidian sands around uh, Fairy Falls. So a few other spots like that where it's really squat and just puts on a beautiful view, uh, bloom if you get a good year for it. The other ones are actually things that are common in the park. So stone crop is really common on almost all the geyser basins, but also common at low elevation, common at 10,000 feet. Like it's just very adaptable um, and does well. And so it's a nice one to be able to pick out. The next one over, so the second one from the right is horsebrush or caniza on the geyser basins like this high. But if you go somewhere else in North America, like anywhere else in Montana, you'll fi find it knee high. <laughs> so there's same species, quite a bit of, uh, it's very weedy, but it's a native plant that's totally native. It's a good guy. And that one grows 
pretty much everywhere in the park as well, but I would say a little more common at Old Faithful. And then the next one, the second one from the left, there's uh, Pussy Paws. And that too is really common in the park. Um, and it has this look, they all tend to be really squat. And that's because they're protecting themselves by remaining low. They just aren't as subject to desiccation and uh, they don't dry out as quickly, but it's a uh, squat kind of spreading out and has really succulent looking leaves. And so you'll see that one all over the geyser basin as well. And then we have the monkey flowers, the yellow monkey flowers. Talk a little bit about yellow monkey flowers. There's a location at Old Faithful that we've actually closed the off trail travel because it's so special in that it gets all, so typically monkey flowers grow in wetlands. But here, you'll see them growing on what I would not call a wetland. Like they are getting water from the geyser basin and in this, um, or from thermal features. And sometimes it's a thermal, thermally influenced wetland, but most of the time it's coming off a geyser. And the center is holding the water up long enough that these things can grow. So at this location um, around Lone Star, it is really only getting water from snow melt. And so this researcher out of Missoula has collected the seeds and they did a great article in the natural history thing that comes out of Missoula on this monkey flower. Um, so anyway, she's looked at it and grew the seeds in the greenhouse and found that it still has that same structure. And it's the only one that they were able to get to bloom with less than 12 hours of daylight. So they collected seeds from other uh, thermal areas as well, not just the thermal areas at Lone Star. And so that was really unique. And she says that it's rapidly speciating towards a new species and it would be another endemic for the park, but it's thousands of years off. So we're still <laughs> not, in, uh, not in a new species here. And then they also looked at the hairs on the leaves and found that the hairs are actually, the function is to shed the snow on the leaves uh, and so help it photosynthesize quicker. Another grass that's in the thermal areas is hot springs panic grass. And this one is uh, really common in the US, but it likes hot soil and it has a uh, fungus that grows in the roots and helps it grow at really high temperatures. And so they found that without the fungus, it can still grow and the fungus is okay too. But neither of them can survive in these really high temperatures without each other. And so that's really neat. And then this one is what I like to put out there because it's really easy to see right now in the winter. So if you're actually getting into the interior, it's on the trailhead for Grizzly Lake. And this is Warm Springs Spike Rush. It is a thermal obligate. It really needs to have hot water. And so this picture is where it's growing in Obsidian Creek, also found in Grand Tetons National Park. And then there's a different variety that's found all over North America. But this one is pretty much isolated to here. And then California, which it may have been not, you know, might have been an accidental introduction kind of thing. It might not really supposed to be a California, but it is in California. <laughs> so this one, I used to always think it was only bathwater temperature. And then Two years ago, we had a researcher that was um, looking at thermal gradients and said he wanted to see how hot things could grow. And I was out with him and said this was growing uh, at Norris kind of on a frying pan situation and then also around a uh, mud volcano. So it's definitely one you need to be careful. It's not like just bath water temperature. You can burn yourself, <laughs> which you don't want to do. But it's really easy to identify and the spot at Grizzly Curve is one of our wetland mitigation sites. So we've taken a lot of pictures and I don't know if anyone remembers, but like two years ago, all of a sudden it was gone and there was just yes. all, yeah, yeah. And so now it seems to be back, but we had a well there. And so we had to actually dig the well out because it was buried in all the plant matter. And so I'm kind of thinking that it just ended up suffocating the live plants out until water moved that plant material through again. I don't know, but it seems to be back. <laughs> so when you're on the geyser basin, another thing to look for that usually indicates it's hot ground is mosses. And that's because they don't have roots. They don't have to worry about 
uh, burning their roots. And it doesn't always mean that it's hot ground, but sometimes it's a good thing to look for. And mosses also have some adaptations for the thermal basins. For one thing, they're able to dry, um, to curl up really quickly, which helps them keep them drying out. But they also, some of them have these clear tips and that helps diffuse the light and uh, protect the DNA inside their cells. And then some of them have some hairs on them as well. Then we have three endemics here. San Verbena is the first one I'm gonna talk about and we'll talk about it again some more later. All of them have their own set of threats, but San Verbena used to grow uh, from basically along the whole shore of Yellowstone Lake. So from Mary Bay to Fishing Bridge and then a couple other locations. From herbarium specimens, we know that those populations have been wiped out. We actually have a collection that says behind Fishing Bridge Visitor Center, and there is no population anymore. <laughs> this particular species, its main threat is probably just that we could wipe it out. Like humans could definitely wipe this population mm -hmm. out. And there's a uh, two populations left in the world in Yellowstone. San Verbenas in general are prone to rarity. There's 14 species in North America, but some of them are even more endangered than the ones we have here because they're growing in these sandy locations where there's dune bites and ATVs, that kind of thing that's ripping them up. So this one's threats are definitely valid, but when you compare it to these other locations, it makes it look a little less daunting, I guess. And then Yellowstone sulfur buckwheat is our second endemic. It grows at Old Faithful and also at Madison, right off uh, TP Village. If any of you, um, you know, go see TPs at Madison, that now seem to be the thing that to put up there. There, that's right there. Some other spots too, but the easiest place to see it is off the Old Faithful Inn or uh, at Madison Junction. It grows on these uh, thermally altered glacial till, so on obsidian sand. The other one is in this location on Yellowstone Lake where it's just yeah. us going to it, but this one is growing at places where we need to put infrastructure. So our projects like putting in a new sewer line or building a dorm is what impacts the species. And then the last one is Ross's bent grass, and this one is not sexy at all, but we like to say that it leads the James Dean life cycle of living fast and dying young. <laughs> so it's a annual grass and it um, basically what that means is that it's speeding up its life cycle because it's growing on really hot soil temperatures and it needs to complete its life cycle before it starts having to deal with the sun's rays as well as the heat coming off the thermal feature. So by the end of May, this thing is set seed, and the easiest place to see it is Biscuit Basin. Its uh, main threat is probably weeds, because uh, the geyser basins are some of our oldest reports for things like cheatgrass and other, um, like there's a bright pink geranium sort of plant that mm. blooms always, I think it was actually blooming in February when I was down there, <laughs> and that's a weed, and so this undoubtedly taking over some of its habitat. I mean, we can't document that, but it's pretty likely. <laughs> and so because it's winter, I like to add a picture of aspen trees. They are the largest living organism. And I recently learned that they photosynthesize a lot in their bark. That's kind of interesting that they're photosynthesizing in the winter. And you'll notice that some animals actually eat the bark. And I think humans have ate the bark as well as kind of starvation food. So just something to think about in the winter when we don't have very many things blooming. Willows also photosynthesize in their bark. This is Anne's photo, but I have more of yours. <laughs> she is nice enough to give me these photos. I don't take nearly enough pictures. They also have sticky buds and that helps them to keep from freezing. Here you can see how yellow they are and that's them photosynthesizing but the other thing is they're very flexible and so we use them a lot in our revegetation projects for anyone who drives over the gardener bridge by sheep feeder often that's one of our wetland mitigation sites and we have put literally thousands of willows in there it's on the uptick like my our, our monitoring is showing that there's willows there and they're growing and one of these days, we're going to have the willow forest. Just on a restoration note, it's a really good 
a place that demonstrates how much compaction impacts your the success of restoration and how it takes a lot of plant material to overcome those kind of issues because we have been dumping native plants and spraying weeds and putting seed down for at least six years now. <laughs> so um, hopefully one of these days it's going to look really good. So one of the uh, weeds that we're really battling in the park is desert alyssum. And it is a mustard. So in the same family as kale and broccoli and all the things are. And if you're definitely sure what this is, you know, I encourage people to grab it, put it in your lunch, eat it, man. This is good for you. Um, it was actually pretty like recently brought to the U.S. Um, or introduced to the U.S. I think it was the 30s. Ah means without, and listen means madness. So it means without madness. And it was introduced for as sort of a medicinal thing, I guess, for people to eat it. So it, this is a picture of Gardner and it's probably blooming around here. It's, the thing is that it is a winter annual. So what that means is that it germinates in the fall. And then it overwinters throughout the winter and in the spring, it can just start automatically sucking up moisture before the native plants can. Mm -hmm. So all of our, almost all of our native plants are germinating in the spring and not the fall. And so that's how it gets that light up. It also is sticky. And so if you imagine chia seeds, that's what happens when this gets wet. And so it can stick to surfaces that are near vertical. That means that it's difficult for carpenter ants to move it, um, but kind of bad for us because it can grow on very vertical surfaces and it can survive that wetting and re-wetting process quite a few times. So if you want to learn more about sticky plants and see the carpenter ants going after this, Eric Lopresti does a lot of work on sticky plants, including San Verbena and his video is here and it's really, it's a great video. This is just the illustration though of what happens with desert alyssum and how it takes and converts these nice sagebrush meadows that have forbs or wildflowers like geranium and lupine and pretty much ends up with just solid alyssum in the understory. Which brings me to my other point that I like to tell people because for some reason, this park is committed to saying that Yellowstone is a grassland. It is not a grassland. <laughs> so you come away with anything today. It's This is a sagebrush step. We're not in grassland here. <laughs> Even though I know that there are many other people telling you otherwise. You can just say, I heard it from the botanists. We're not in a grassland. Okay, so some other sticky plants are, that are native is curly cup gumweed. It's one that we've been using in restoration because it grows cheek and jaw basically with the weeds. It also has a ton of seed. I think it has this really lovely smell of here that you're going to have to have people, even right now, if you touch it, it's sticky. It's kind of this nice citrus smell. I don't know if everyone's as fond of it as I am, but, uh, you know, try it for yourself. Give it a smell. Some countries, they actually take that stickiness and harvest it. We don't in the U.S., but I thought that was kind of fun to learn that they are harvesting it in other countries. Here's a herbarium specimen for people to see what that looks like. This is probably one that Anne glued, actually, so we can see her great work. And so back to San Verbena. San Verbena has stickiness on the leaves, and so the sand sticks to it. And this researcher, Eric Lopresti, wanted to know if the sand was actually camouflaging the leaves or if it was just being a, a mechanical thing that insects wouldn't want to eat. So he took and painted the sand green and went to see which one the insects would eat. And it turned out that basically they just don't want to eat it because it's like eating a sandwich that has sand in it and it wore down their mandibles and they ended up having lower rates of uh, reproductive success. And that was kind of interesting. And his article is there. Uh, so if anyone wants to read more about it, but he also really wanted to help the park out. He started, he collected the seeds and started growing the seeds for us because as I mentioned, we knew that there were some locations, well, many locations in the park where it's been wiped out. Uh, so we, Storm Point is where this plant grows. We closed it off because there was a tour guide that was taking people off trail. We could really have actually just probably 
hold their permit and not close it, but you know, it might give it a little more protection. I'm not sure. So he closed it off, said no off trail travel in this area. And then we also put some bumper logs up to help protect it, but was really fun. And, and so we've also done some spraying. We've been spraying sheet grass there for a lot of years. I'm not sure herbicide gallons are down, but the thing is that it really varies. And, and anyone who has sprayed will can tell you this. Um, I would like to believe it's helping, but we put in, so Alex Zeiderman put in some monitoring plots this year. And so hopefully in the next few years, we'll actually be able to see if our uh, chemical treatments are doing anything. In addition to spraying weeds, we've also been pulling the uh, cheatgrass that's closest to the sand verbena and then pulling the stuff right off the trail as well, you know, so visitors don't end up getting on their clothing and that kind of thing. We've been doing a lot of weed work out there that we haven't necessarily done prior to this. More pictures of a spray. And these are the bumper logs we installed. So that's another thing that's a little confusing. So this, this is a social trail and it is actually open to the public. So if you go out there, sometimes people move the log, making it look like it's closed. But it's actually open and we wanted it to be open and we just don't want people going off the social trail. So that's why the bumper logs are there. It's because the plant is right on the other side of the bumper logs and a great spot to see it play trail. This is the exciting part. He grew out a whole bunch of these sand verbenas and we planted on that Pelican Nature Trail. And it was a terrible drought year. We were watering them. My parents were visiting. I was like, nope, we're going to water plants. Come on, guys. <laughs> I know this may not be what you want to do on your vacation, but we are watering plants. <laughs> and then in 2022, he grew out more and we planted more out there. 2022 was a great year. And then last year, we had a wonderful moisture year. Uh, unfortunately, his lab moved, so he wasn't able to grow out more plants for us. But... He did come and census it. And what I thought was really exciting is that in 2023, he counted 149 plants there and 31 of them were new recruits. So the plants that we were planting were reproducing. is actually the second biggest population right now in the park. So there's the Storm Point population and then there's one at Rock Point, which is about 30 plants. And then there's one plant at a picnic area, um, and actually I couldn't find it last year, so that one's probably extinct. He also took and glued seeds to toothpicks, and we stuck the toothpicks in here, and then at um, Mary Bay, and that way we were able to go back to the toothpicks and see how many of them germinated. It's not a bad way to go about planting, but we definitely had higher success with the uh, plants that were grown in the greenhouse and the bigger you get them, the more likely they are to succeed kind of thing. So anyway, this is really exciting and I don't I don't know if we can declare this success yet. Hopefully the plants will remain there. We put we would like to ultimately uh, have a plant at the fishing bridge visitor center so people can look at it. And I keep trying to get signs put up here, but we haven't been super successful at getting that up and going. So so then these are actually some stuff that happened last year. So last year we had a really great water year and uh, also I got to go to Beckler, which doesn't often happen for work. And so one of the things that I found was this new sedge for the park. Kind of fun because we were at Denanda. And so for people who haven't been there, it's the prime soaking spot. And the two women that were with me had never been to Denanda. And uh, I really didn't want, they really wanted to soak and I was kind of begrudgingly letting them soak because I thought I'm going to be a terrible supervisor if I don't let them. I'm like, they're so damn looking around like, come on, get going, you know, we need to get moving. It's going to rain and we got to get this plant press out of here. And then I found this thing. Um, so that was really fun. I had been to Denanda a whole, you know, many times and had never noticed the sedge. So that was fun. And I got back and I was texting with my friend and he's like, did you take a picture? I said, no. And he sends me this picture and he said, did it look like this? 
And I said, yeah, that's it. And he said, I sent you this picture a couple of years ago. You didn't know what it was. Anyway, he actually found it. I, I just didn't know what it was. But you can see it. So uh, from a herbaria that are online, I just put in a quick search to see where it showed up in uh, the states. And so you can see in, in the West, this is these are the locations. So it's pretty common, but it we ha we don't have it in the park. And it's pretty obvious. So I think that... Uh, actually, if it was in a lot of locations, we would have found it by now, but there's probably more in Buffler for sure. And then we found a ton of itty bitty plants, which was also really exciting because as most, most of you remember, it was a really wet summer, unlike this winter. And uh, so the, the little annuals just love that kind of moisture. And so this guy was prior to this year, only known from a couple locations and we found it growing all over the sagebrush in Hayden Valley. And then at Lamar, we found it. Uh, so we increased the population and it's really tiny. I mean, when I first found this thing, I was kind of like, um, it was just in the bud. So it wasn't fully blooming. And I just kept looking at it like, is that something different? You know, you had to get down there on your belly and really take a look at it. <laughs> And then, so the other thing we found were moonworts. And moonworts are this beloved plant. They're ferns that are tiny. And Yellowstone is not very diverse with moonworts. But if you go anywhere, if you're like rare plant people, usually my first job for the Forest Service was surveying for moonworts because they're just really common in some places. And usually if you find one, you find like, a zillion other species and you're always crawling on your knees and so that's why botanists love them and they can be in like old logging roads they're not necessarily have to be in these pristine environments but they also can live underground and they have a relationship with fungus again and so that's another reason that they need a good year to come up because they'll be fine underground for years and years and years. So anyway, we found one of these guys and the only other location for this species that was known in Yellowstone was at Grizzly Lake. And it's from our herbarium record and it literally says Grizzly Lake. And so to relocate something like this without coordinates is pretty hard even when it's as specific as Grizzly Lake. Like you have to spend some time crawling on your hands and knees. That's the distribution for this guy. Um, so this is for Wyoming. So it is a rare plant and it is pretty rare for the state. This just shows how rare it is for the West. So in, in Montana, it's not so rare. Wyoming, I guess it's middle of the road, but that's still pretty, pretty rare. And so then the other one that we found with this um, little gymnosterus, and this one is uh, the only location we knew of prior to this was Glen Creek, and then a location at Fishing Bridge. And so uh, we were evaluating a new road alignment in Hayden Valley, and all of a sudden started seeing all kinds of this thing. It was having a wonderful bloom. We ended up mapping acres of uh, this little guy that's very, very tiny. And so we can take that one off the rare plant list that was just under surveyed for. And so then back to Beckler. So that sedge was not the only thing we were down there in Buckler looking for. Um, Buckler is really, I've been trying to figure out what defines Buckler and it's these waterfalls, thermal features, really lush, um, but they're also like pretty recent lava flows or on the edge of the pitch stone. And so the pitch stone is recent lava flows. And so we also have defined Buckler as a conservation area. And that's what you're seeing up here. But it's a big area that's really under underexplored. And so it's hard to come up with conservation goals for such a big area. But one of the things that we decided to do was to go to look to this orchid. Here it is. Uh, because um, this is another thing that's really actually rare in the state of Wyoming and pretty rare in Montana, just rare in the West. So we went and uh, looked at a historic population just to make sure it was still there, and then ended up finding a couple other locations for it. So that was that was really fun. But the, the thing that was so interesting about it, so we found it at Silver Scarf Thermal Area, which is sort of around Denanda. These other things that we're growing with it are really common. So there's this beak spike rush that's all over 
the park pretty much. It's it's like a rare plant in Montana, but in Yellowstone, it grows in every thermal feature out there. And then the paintbrush is pretty common too. And so I haven't really been able to put my finger on why this orchid is growing in that location in Buckler, but not in not in the rest of the park and thermally influenced wetlands. And have been asking various people and so far none of us anyway, the geologist Jeff. I asked him if he had any ideas. He told me I was supposed to tell him. I'm looking for theories. This is just uh, a map showing how rare it is. So you can see that uh, in Wyoming, it's red, which is critically imperiled. This is the locations that it's now known in the park. Prior to that, prior to our surveys this summer, it was known in two locations. And we uh, took it to four locations. And I think there was only one other location for the state of Wyoming. So this was really great to just find out more information about this plant. And also like know that if we have the time to go wander around Buckler and thermal areas, we probably find more of this. Then, okay, so many of you may or may not know that white bark pine has become listed, that five needle pines are pretty tricky. And as humans, we want to put names on things, right? We don't want to just call it a five needle pine. We want to know if it's limber or white bark. And that's really hard to do without cones. Here's some examples of how the cones vary. The cones in white bark are really like this beautiful maroon kind of color. But most of the time, things aren't producing cones. We've had to start surveying for this. When we surveyed between Norris and oh, uh, Swan Lake, we found thousands of these. <laughs> and that was really only in like 50 feet off the road. And so it's it's amazing how there are five needle pines everywhere. And I think most people would like to say that's not white bark pine, that is limber pine, right? Because of the elevation. And unfortunately, when we did that survey, we weren't able to send them away for DNA sampling. But then we did surveys for Pebble Creek because uh, they're also going to be widening the road there. And so of they um, sampled 568 five needle plowing and they sent 98 of them out to have DNA analysis done. And all of them came back as white bark pine. Really interesting. And they were all really small, one to three inch DBH. I really expected to see a mix. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're not growing together, but it certainly seems to indicate there's a lot more white bark pine out there than we thought there were. So that's that's really exciting. I'm hoping we getting them DNA tested so we can find out more about five needle pine. Okay, and on to the herbarium, the plant board. <laughs> Herbaria have served a really important roles in plant conservation throughout the years. And so I wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like to collect because it is actually a lot of work, particularly because I'm not a horse person. So this is the, the plant press goes on my back. Five pounds or three pounds more, whatever is actually a lot when you're backpacking. This is what it looks like. We dig them up and kind of throw them in this plant press. And so these specimens, have helped to determine what things are rare. Because you can pull up those records, right, for the whole state like I did before and see how many, see what the distribution of a species is. And just um, usually things are, herbaria have a good representation of common species. And um, if it is rare, sometimes there's things on the, hints on the herbarium label that help you determine what kind of habitat it is and what things it's growing with. This is spring beauty and uh, probably lots of you know that the bears eat it and dig it up. And when I was digging this one up, I had a really good knife on me and I just was, could not believe how far down that rut was and how, I mean, the bulb is big, but nothing like eating a Kit Kat bar, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. it just seemed like it was really, the animals are really working for this food. And so then this is, uh, I love this picture. This person was helping Aiden Nelson collect in Yellowstone. And Aiden Nelson was, he arrived by train with this person. Basically, you can see his shoes are worn out. They were, they collected 10,000 specimens in Yellowstone. Wow. And so how it worked in the day is you'd collect like a thousand balsam root, right? And then you'd send them out to other institutions. And those institutions would send you different plants in return. So he was building the collection for RM. So Rocky Mountain Herbarium out of Laramie is the biggest herbaria in the um, 
in the Rockies or and, and that's the, the collection he was building. But they were changing the newspaper once a day on these things because otherwise they'd mold. And so I've I've never only once have I had something mold on me here just because it's so dry. Uh, so I, I think that just speaks to the volumes of plants that you're collecting when things are molding in the press on you. Know. So they're also, um, herbaria are also served to help us with the genetics. Right now, uh, there's a woman, Hannah, that is working on looking at what bison and other ungulates are eating in the park. And so she has been taking, she's been collecting her own specimens that will go in our herbaria. Um, and then I, she's also been taking little plants, uh, plant fragments off of my collection and DNA testing it and then looking at the fecal samples of bison and elk and all that and seeing what plants show up in those uh, samples. And so the, the really awesome thing about this that she's on board is I reviewed one of their papers. There were a few things that stood out as being really unlikely that the bison were eating just because we have one historic record for Yellowstone, right? And it's and I've never seen it in my 20 years here. And so then when you question the identity of something, you can go back to the herbarium specimen and look at it and see if it was truly that specimen or if it was just misidentified. That's how herbarium specimens really help with the genetics and publishing papers is that you have a voucher specimen that you can go back to. And I, unfortunately, a lot of wildlife biologists don't do that. And so that's what's really awesome that she's doing it. Here's another picture of us collecting. And then also they help to document local extinctions. So I mentioned that we know that there used to be San Bernardino that was documenting a local extinction, but this plant, Plains Gay Feather, uh, used to be probably in Gardner and in the park because it grows right outside the park. But likely, look, you know, it's really pretty. Like we could have picked too much of it and wiped it out that way, or it might be that um, there's been so much impacts the gardener with the hay fields and irrigation ditches that it got wiped out that way. But we know from a herbarium specimen that it was here and that's probably a local extirpation that's happened as well. And then also we've gotten new reports. So I mentioned voucher specimens. Um, some years we find new things for the park because somebody goes out and collects it. But other years, in this case, we had a researcher looking at our collection and realized that some things were misidentified. And so we gained two new species that year just because they, the right person happened to look at our specimens and realize that something else had been collected. The monkey flowers, uh, you may only grow certain colors in certain thermal areas, like the yellow ones are over near the springs and the red ones were. Yeah, um, they're, well, they're different species. But they, there are three species, actually there might be four species of yellow monkey flowers in the park. So each species tends to kind of have a certain habitat, except like the tall pink one, the Lewis's monkey flower. You know, you're looking at me like, okay, jive over Dun Raven, you're right in those rock cuts, there's beautiful pink um, Lewis's monkey flower, it's like knee high, absolutely gorgeous. But it grows with the yellow one, but they are separate species. Okay. Yeah. Yes? So um, when you showed the slides of the rocks and you talked about them, you kind of still was pulling. Yeah. It's sad that they don't have roots and they don't have to really pick rocks so. uh, But the, I think that they all have steam in there, there, and I don't know how how they interact with the steam exactly, but that stuff isn't like really nice tap water, but, you know, not not, uh, not temperature, but composition. Yeah. It goes on. What gives with that? Same with the monkey flowers that grow up, like right, right. in the steam vents and stuff. I don't know. But what I did forget to mention was that um, all three of the endemics are tied tightly to the thermal areas. Mm -hmm. And we had a woman come and inventory our mosses um, and basically everywhere in the park, even a good majority of the backcountry. And she also found that our unusual mosses came out in the thermal areas and some of it in really hot water, like they were aquatic yeah. um, species that were growing in the water. So they 
And, and there is another, there is one species of moss that is, um, it's called the rock forming moss. And so it's in uh, mammoth. And basically this thing is a, how it deals with the um, travertine in the water is that it forms like a little pedestal and keeps growing higher and higher. And so the base forms rock because it's exuding the travertine. So I think some species do have ways of dealing with the, the heavy metals and the, yeah. but I don't know how, I don't know any more than that. You mentioned that protosynthesis occurs in the Aspen bark, but Aspen bark is silvery, if anything highly reflected. Do you know how they absorb sunlight in the bark? Uh, I don't, except sometimes it looks gleaming, like for sure. Yeah, so I don't think it's the silver stuff that's um doing this. The ones that kind of have the deep green tinge to it. John Barr did a lot of research on photosynthesis net and the bark. And north of the Colorado Wyoming border it is much less, south is dramatically more. Mm -hmm. And you can simply take a little bit of iodine. I don't know if you're in school, took the data and dropped iodine on to see the productive starch. You can do that with an Espen bar. And so that you can take a little uh, cutter and cut in and pull the bark out and sample it. So you can look up his work on there. But farther south, you know, the more photosynthetic it is, and it's definitely chlorophyll on the bark. Um, I was a little unclear. You were talking about using DNA analysis to differentiate between limber and white bark kind? Yes, they just took needles and sent them away to a lab. So they were between one to three inch DBH. So ones that would be cone producing, I think you could do it when they were smaller than that. Uh, but really, honestly, even the, the big trees, it's hard to tell. John King was telling me there's actually a way to tell on the bark that you can tell, but I think he spent a lot more time around them than I have, so I, I wouldn't be able to tell without cones on them. Gotcha. So the cone is the main way that you would Yeah. Out in the Lamar Valley over the last probably year, they've been erecting some small explosions out there on the valley floor. Is that something that the botany department is studying? And if so, what is it? Uh, not the botany department, but the bison crew. Okay. And I believe it's part of their explosions on what the bison are eating. Speaking of explosions, of course, it's a bunch of them in Lamar. They've been there for Ever. What's being learned from them? Um, I mean, we can see from the road that yeah. a bunch of uh, aspens in there, but other I don't know anything about them, honestly. Yeah. The only exposure I can tell you about is the one that lost trick for the wetland mitigation there. Mm -hmm. And if you want to learn about the wetland mitigation, I can talk about that exposure. What's with the fence area? When yeah. I tell them that it's wetland mitigation, they stop and laugh at me. Before that culvert was undersized and it was draining the wetland. So I don't know if you noticed how that head cut just kept getting bigger and going back further into the wetland. And so um, we actually filled the wetland. And so uh, we did that by taking a lot of willows that were called post assisted, post -assisted structures. And they um, stuck them in there and then also put rock and soil in and did a planting. So anyway, we're anxiously awaiting what happens in the spring. And if this is going to both, actually us not having much moisture, probably both well, because it's not likely to wash out, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of what you're worried about, or I was worried about, because I don't want it, us to have to harvest willows again. <laughs> it was a lot of willows. So we fenced it because I just was really worried that the bison and elk going through there would chew it up. And we would never get any willows to take hold, and our plants wouldn't take hold. And so then, uh, once they finish the bridge, they're going to take that road out, which probably everyone knows. Then that, that will also become sort of wetland mitigation credit, but they'll have a bridge that goes over the road, over where the road is now, and the guided trails, Antero, Chuck Wagon trails, yeah. On the explosions, the first ones were put in the 30s. Yeah. Most were put in the 50s. They're part the publication. That lists all of the exposure, like what exposure in the archives. We could dig into it a little bit wider. Well, Don was Spain worked on that a lot. Mm -hmm. They would look at very soon. That was mm -hmm. in the 30s. By the 50s of the exposure, about half of them have uh, go to Aspen Hills, and it has to be Aspen Hills that have one of their earlier. Well, well, the plants that the bison are, that, that the bison are grazing, and that, and that, that could be a very I have a thing for wildlife biologists. This is out of Brown University and they 
apparently have um, done this in Africa and composed the di diet there for ungulates. Mm -hmm. But um, so they're trying to do that in Yellowstone, uh, which is really cool and exciting. Um, and it's not just bikes in, they're also collecting fecal samples from other ungulates. So looking at what they're eating, and that's that's fun because they're, you know, they're gonna publish the results and they're finding that they're not um, just eating grasses, right? Which is, I think, why people tend to refer to Yellowstone as being a grassland, because we're so used to thinking about it in wildlife terms. What she was telling me, and I'm not, I'm probably not really explaining this right, but that not all plants are going to stay in the system as long as others. So some might just um, stay on longer and it's easy to pick those up with a fecal sample but then other ones the, they might eat it and it doesn't actually have much of a signature right and so they're just being they could be underrepresented in those samples just because the dna doesn't stick around very long exactly i think that the protocol is like it picked it up within 24 hours yeah. or something like that. But do you look at uh, beavers at all when you're doing your wet organization work? Um, no, but I, yeah, that would be fun. Um, I mean, that is those structures, post system structures, they're also known as beaver analog systems. So, but, um, no, we just, our wet mitigation, so in the park service that can only be inspiration, it can't be creation or enhancement. Yeah, so often we've been pretty, well, we've been most successful when there's an old road and just taking the old road out, but uh, we don't have that many old roads left that we can take <laughs> out. So now we're kind of looking at, it is an old road, but it's different. So by out park on the other side of the road there, there's a pit, giving pits. Doug, Doug and Judge will probably know where this pit is. Anyway, there's an old road that comes out right at, um, shoot, Artist Paint Pot State. <coughs> it goes back. Essentially, they built this road 1900s by just putting a ditch on both sides and so draining the water through that wetland. And so now, like, we're proposing to restore it by filling in the ditches, and that's not a popular concept. Typically, we don't put fill in wetlands, we take fill out of wetlands, and that's what we're comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so everyone wants to just take the, like, basically lower the road. Lower the road, all we're going to do is create a really big ditch, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then... You know, you also have to fill, figure out some way to decompact the road and fill in the ditches and create some sort of resistance so that it doesn't run out those ditches, even if you just put material in. So that's our, kind of our next big restoration project that I'm excited about. By Pelican, if you've gone over at Lake, the, the Pelican Viaduct, that was our most recent wetland restoration. And that one is actually not quite as successful as I'd like if you... Walk around there in the fall, there's a lot of corduroy in there that they should have taken out, but technically they met the contract because they lowered it to the grade that was in the spec. And unfortunately, like the contractor never was like, hey, there's still material in here. We should really pull this out. Mm -hmm. And so now we'll see what happens. We might have to go back in there and take it out to lower it some more. On that subject, I know all along, we call it Golden Gate to Norris Road, there's a lot of drift fences and construction detritus that remains in place. That ever gonna go anywhere? Is it serving any purpose or is it just trash at this stage? They're writing it. The good news is that if, um, so I fully they're gonna get money to do um, the parking lot for Norris and expand that. Also like do some work at Golden Gate. But anyway, if they do that, they'll pull all the silk fences, which would be amazing because I agree with you. It doesn't look great. I thought, Carrie, you were gonna point out all those amazing wells that are along that segment. Those are wetland mitigation sites. Hopefully <laughs> those will get pulled in a couple of years. Years too. <laughs> I worked for the Forest Service for almost a year doing, I was working in a nursery there. And also it was a combination of working in the nursery and doing rare plant surveys. And then I worked a little bit um, doing a couple other jobs as a botanist for rare plant surveys as well for the Forest Service. 
No, I really, honestly, I've been at Yellowstone a long time. But it doesn't feel like a long time, but I haven't. Well, you're obviously in Montana, and you have my license. No, Wisconsin. No. Did you adopt I was going to say, the my other big experience was that I, you know, spent, my dad's a lawyer, so I did have some experience yeah. working with him before I went to school and that kind of thing. So you know, I was going for the pronunciation of C-R-E-E-K. Oh, Crick? Oh, um, yeah, no, definitely. Oh, okay. I mean, I come from Indiana. Okay, okay, yeah. No, I'm not from Montana. And going back to explosions, do you have any idea what was being studied in those explosions along Old Yellowstone Trail Road that they recently taken down? Well, that was actually part of restoring. That is a, actually kind of a grassland, but not, it was, it was native sagebrush. And then we planted crusted wheat grass there. And so it was converted to this exotic grassland. And so they put those exposures up to try to restore sagebrush did a lot of native plantings there and they and john klepkowski is the one to talk to really and lots of weed treatments and actually they had a panel come and talk about how to restore that area and so they made the recommendation of putting um the fencing up and then uh it became kind of out of out of vogue i'd say out of style to leave it up and so we took it down <laughs> Yeah. Was it successful in restoring the sagebrush? I don't think so, but I mean, I don't, I also really truthfully like walk that road and try to look for native plants, you know, like I'm not, I mean, and they tried cover crops and they did a burn there when Roy was my boss. So they've done a lot of different things. I want to say the burn was actually the most successful, but I'm, I'm way out of my element. You should talk to John Kopelski. He would know. Geranium, uh, yeah. Backdrop is beautiful. Thank you. Is that yeah. the only place in the block where that stuff grows? No, native plant or the park's wildflower. And uh, they chose it even after San Verbena. They knew San Verbena was the endemic to the park. And I think probably because it has this really nice wide blooming window. I mean, you can see it starting in probably June through October. It really blooms a long time. It grows in all kinds of wetlands. So thermal wetlands. This was like a normal kind of freshwater meadow, I would say. Right. It was just adjacent to the shore. I've seen those sphinx pollinator moss pollinating them. Yeah. So it's, those are cool. Yeah. I was wondering how a botanist defines native and invasive. That's a hard question. Goodness, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer that. <laughs> we also sometimes talk about weeds versus other plants. What's that distinction? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really traditional and I'm just sticking with like if it wasn't here to begin with. I mean, I think those definitions, I, there are a few things that grow in the park that were probably not here originally, but grow in like Thermopolis kind of thing and another thermal influence wetland. Those are hard definitions. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you for joining us for this program. If you like the program, we have a channel on YouTube. Go to YouTube and search for Gathering a Naturalist. You may also visit our website at tracknature.com where you'll find our books, classes, and other products. Our books are available on amazon.com. Again, thank you for joining us. And this is Jim Halfpenny. Take care, my friends.